Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. I had to turn to Luke, the 18th chapter. We're going to talk about something in a moment. Now, normally we turn to Hebrews. But what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks, just a a couple of weeks, is we're going to take a sidestep into, uh, uh, from the book of Hebrews, and look at some things uh, regarding finances in our lives. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Because oftentimes I think the same thing. Oh, no, the preacher just said finances. But let me just talk about this just for a moment. It's so critical for you and I in our lives to have our financial lives in order. If it wasn't so important, we wouldn't see the references of finances, the teaching of finances all throughout the Bible. We wouldn't see all throughout the New Testament the importance of being good stewards of what God has given us. We would not hear and see from Jesus' own words and his own life the importance that finance has in our lives. But you know, the reality is, is that it's important. It's so important that Jesus talked about it uh, often. It's so important that we have got to pay attention and we do ourselves an injustice if we think that whenever we come to church that we would just leave that, well, this is yours, this is mine, I don't want to talk about this, I don't want to talk, this is off limits to you, but you can talk about this. The, re- the reality is, is finances are directly tied into our service of God. And I'm going to make a statement in just a moment. So what we're doing is we're talking about finances. Normally I try to come up with a clever title. Normally I try to put a lot of thought. And I, 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 you know, I really, I really did put a lot of thought. But I stand here today as I give you the title of this morning's message. I stand here almost ashamed because the title is so unoriginal that I'm afraid to tell it to you. But here today, the title of this morning's message, if you're taking notes, is Freedom for Our Future. Today we're going to talk about freedom for our future. Not talk about the capital stewardship camp, but we're going to talk about some things in our lives. Now I'm going to make a statement. We live in a, in a, in a society. We live in a culture. And I'm not going to get on my, side, my cultural soapbox or anything like that. But we live in a world that we do not have a mature or realistic understanding of finances. We live in a world that says a better living brings us a better life. Now I'm going to make a statement before I go any further. It is critical for you and I to have a grasp of our financial lives. To have, let me say it like this, to have our financial lives in order, in order to effectively serve God. Whoa, that's a crazy statement. Did I just say that? Yes, I said that you and I have to have our financial lives in order, in order to effectively serve God. That's a bold statement, and I promise we will, we will wrap that up. You will get the whole story of it. But we must have our financial, order, our, our financial lives in order. See, so our culture tells us that living big means having a better life. I'm going to say it like this one preacher said it. Uh, a better standard of living produces a better quality of life. We, we, we live in a world that tells us that a better standard of living produces a better quality of life. What does that mean? That means that if I live on that side of town versus this side of town. That means if I drive this brand of vehicle versus that kind of vehicle. That means if I wear this kind of clothes versus that kind of clothes. If I drink this kind of coffee versus that kind of coffee. Whatever it might be. That if I have a higher standard of living, if I have better things in my life, that my life will actually be a, a life that is more, uh, has more quality to it. My life will actually be better based on the things that I have. But the reality is, is that you and I know full well, there's not a person in here that doesn't know or doesn't understand that that kind of a statement is not true. We know that because we say this statement all the time. Money cannot buy Okay, maybe we don't know that statement. Now you know it. We'll say it one more time. Money cannot buy happiness. So how do we achieve it? How do we get it? How do we get this happiness? How do, how do we have this fulfillment in life if it doesn't come from a high standard of living? I had you turn to Luke in the 18th chapter. Speaking about finances, I mean, you can't avoid it. Luke 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Talking about money. Jesus. Luke, the 18th chapter, the Bible tells us uh, this is an encounter, not a parable, but an encounter that somebody's actually uh, uh, coming to Jesus. And we see this reflected in Matthew and Mark's gospel as well. Luke, the 18th chapter, verse number 18, it says that a young ruler, a certain ruler, Matthew and Mark say a, a rich young ruler. Now I've got that word ruler highlighted. Look to your neighbor and say ruler. Look to your other neighbor and say ruler. 
See, I'm doing this to make sure that you're awake because we got we to get what we're talking about today. So we've established that this is a ruler. What does a ruler have? A ruler has a high standard of living. Right? This isn't a commoner. This isn't a certain peasant. This isn't a certain man off the streets. This is a certain ruler, a man with stature, a man with possessions, a man with money, a man with power. If he didn't have power, they wouldn't call him a ruler. So here a certain ruler comes to Jesus and asks Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response is, well, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that's God. So Jesus goes on and, and he says to him, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. So the, the ruler comes back to Jesus and he says, all these things I have done from my youth. The interesting statement here is the, the Bible tells us he's a rich young ruler. He's got great possessions. He's, he, he's, got, he's a man of power. He's a man of position. He wasn't coming to Jesus for clarification. He was coming for justification. The reason I say that is Jesus gives him the answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? According to the law that this man knew, this man understand, Jesus laid it out. And if clarification was the case, then he would have said, cool, great, I'm on the right path. That's all. I just wanted to make sure that I'm going the right way. But in Matthew, or in Matthew and Mark's account, the Bible says, well, I've done all this since my youth. What am I missing? There's something more. The million dollar question. What is it? I love how Mark says it in Jesus' reply to him. Mark says that Jesus looked at this young man, loved him, and said to him the following statement that we read in Luke, the same exact statement. But I love this because Jesus loved him enough to tell him exactly what he needed to hear. He hit him like this. He hit him where it hurts, or we say it like this. He read his mail. And Jesus says to him, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. The Bible goes on in verse number 23. It says that he was sorrowful. He walked away. Matthew Mark's account says that he walked away sad because he had great possessions. Here it says he was very rich. Now, I'm, why did I take you to Luke the 18th chapter? Why are we talking about finances? Now, the title of the message is Freedom for Your Future. Freedom for Our Future. We're talking about the rich young ruler who uh, we're talking about what society tells us. So where is this message going? I know you're already thinking, you're like, man, I'm putting this together. I'm putting one and one. You're, Pastor Luke, are you telling me that I'm, we're going to have an offering and just a moment we're going to get rid of all of our... No, I'm just kidding. That's not where we're going. You can, you can take a deep breath, okay? I promise that's not where we're going. Simply put, the rich young ruler was living exactly what we live today. It's not new. It's not just a consumerism society. 2,000 years ago, this man believed that a high standard of living led to his high quality of life. And when Jesus challenged his quality of life by telling him to remove his high standard of living, but have a higher quality life, and hit him where it hurts, it read his mail exactly the issue that he was dealing with, and he walked away because he could not handle it. So important for you and I. So important for you and I. I'm going to make some bold statements in this message today, so I hope you're taking notes. I hope you're paying attention. The biggest competitor for our hearts is not the devil. The biggest competitor for our hearts is not the devil. He is not here to woo your love away, but your attention. I'm going to give you two statements. Two statements you, you almost never hear anybody say. You might have heard people say this, but that's because they were acting in ignorance or, or they just didn't know what they were talking about. But when somebody says this and believes it, you're not going to hear people say this. First and foremost, you're never going to hear or you're not going to hear somebody who really understands what they're saying say this. Man, I sure love the devil. Boy, I'll tell you what, from the moment I was born, he just kind of took me under his wing. He cradled me. He cared for me. He loved me. He showed me everything. He, he is just out to look out for me and I love him for it. You're not going to hear anybody say that. Because the Bible says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not here to take care of you. He's not here to bring you under his wing and show you how to do everything. You know, oh, well, come over here and love me. And all. No, 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 no. The second thing you're not going to hear is you're not going to hear anybody say, man, I wish I made less money. <laughs> you're chuckling because you know, you think, man, if somebody would have said that, I would have slapped them 
But then I would have told them I'm sorry, and then I would have said, you know what, I got a, I got a solution, just give it to me, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll make sure that. Nobody says that. I wish I made less money. Nobody says, man, the devil sure takes care of me. Because the biggest competitor for our hearts is not the devil. Here it is. The biggest competitor for our hearts is money. Is money. Possessions. What money buys. What money brings. What money carries with it. The biggest competitor for our hearts is money. So with that being said, let me take you to what Jesus says in Luke the 16th chapter. I'm going to put it up in the New Living Translation because it's a more modern translation. Jesus says that no one can serve two masters. He will either love one and hate the other. He will despise one or be devoted to one and despise the other. Jesus goes on in the second part of the last part of this verse and he says, you cannot, you cannot, it doesn't say you should not, you cannot serve, listen to this word, both God and money. The reason I have the New Living Translation is because in the New King James it says mammon, which is money. You cannot serve both God and money. It's one or the other. The biggest competitor for our hearts is money. Because money is the easiest thing to take us away or to take our focus away from Christ Jesus. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Phil Pringle was here. He talked about a message. It was a really great message. He talked about Jesus died to be our Savior. But on top of being our Savior, Jesus also died to be our Lord. Becoming our Savior was only the first step of the life that we live. He died to be our Lord and Savior, which means we are not only called to say, Jesus, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life. I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. Salvation, it's a free gift. You can't buy it. Here it is. But now, also after that, now we say, Jesus... I choose this day to follow you, to serve God. So we understand that Jesus died to be our Lord and Savior, which means we serve God. We serve God. We've all said it before. We've all said this before. I, I, if I only had a little bit more. Does anybody ever, let, me, let me jump up and down, and I'll tell you, I, I will first be the first to admit, I have said that, man, if I, if I only made a little bit more, I would be set. If, if, I could, if I could just get that raise. It, it, maybe it was when you were working part-time or you're just getting into the workforce. Man, if I, if I could just get benefits or if I could just go full-time, I'll tell you, the rest of my life will be covered. We've all said it before. We've all said it before. The biggest competitor for our heart is money. Why? Because we live up to our wages. We live up to our, our standards. Whatever comes in through our society, through our mindset, through our thinking, goes right out. The biggest competitor to our heart is money. Jesus challenges us to not serve money. And I know what you're thinking. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm not vain. Pastor Luke, I understand that money, I'm not after it. I'm not trying to, 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 to throw stacks on stacks on stacks. I'm not trying to do any of that stuff. I just want something to, as a tool for, for the kingdom of God. That's, that's where I'm at. Good, great, wonderful. You've got a gr good handle on that. But I'm going to talk about something else. Let me, give you a little, let me give you a little shocking statistic about that statement, if I could just have a little bit more. If you make $35,000 a year, $35,000 a year, did you know that if you make $35,000 a year, you are in the top 5% of wealth on the planet? That's right. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just got lumped in with Warren Buffett, with Bill Gates, and everybody else for $35,000. Top 5% of wealth on the planet. Out of 6.9 billion people, you are the top 5%. 95% of the world makes less. Oh, okay, that's cool. Pastor Luke, I don't make $35,000 a year. All right, the national poverty level, level $24,000 for, for a double income family house. If you make $24,000 a year, you are in the top 10% of wealth in the world. Top 10%. 90% of the world makes less than you. Okay, all right, well, Pastor Luke. I'm single. I'm not a double fan. All right. Okay, okay, okay. If you make $11,000 a year, you are in the top 18% of the world. The top 18% of the world. What that, that means uh, uh, 20 or 80% of the world. 82% of the world makes less than you. But we have this mindset, if I could just get a little bit more. If I could just make it to, if I could just make it to 17%, if I could just make it to 20%, if I could just make it to the top three, the top two, the top one, 
But when we have a healthy understanding of what God's desire for us is, then we understand what we can do in our lives. You see, it's easier for you and I to live outside of our means than it is to live inside of them. It's easier to live outside of our means than it is to live inside of them. How is that even possible? It's very simple. One word, credit. <laughs> credit. We borrow money we don't have to buy things we can't afford. And I'll take it one step further. I love what, what uh, uh, Rogers, what was his name? Will Rogers said, to impress people we don't like. <laughs> it's easier to live outside of our means than it is to live inside because of credit. Did you know, did you know that Americans, Americans hold $830 billion in debt? $830 billion in debt. You, do you remember when you got that stimulus check? Remember that? I was like, praise God, hallelujah, thank you, government. If we were to take the $830 billion of debt and disperse that to every man, woman, and child in America, every one of us, every man, woman, and child. See, stimulus only came to taxpayers. But every man, woman, and child, every person in America would have $2,500 in the bank account. Every person in America. That's how much debt we carry because we live outside of our means. I'm not going to get on my soapbox about this. Don't worry about it. You can breathe again. <gasps> okay, all right. But the realization is that we live under financial pressure. We live under tremendous financial pressure. And half the time, we don't even realize it. We don't even know. It's one of these pressures that's masked. It's disguised in everyday life. The reason it's masked, the reason it's disguised is because everybody around us lives under the same pressure. So surely, if they're going through it, then it's normal for me to go through it. If they've got the issue, then I, I feel good about my... Why? Because misery loves company, right? Right? Is it what you know what I'm talking about? We live under tremendous financial pressure. Did you know the average middle, cl middle class income of America has decreased $10,000 in the past 14 years? Decreased. In 2000, the average middle class income in America was $59,000 and some change. In 2014, the average middle class income in America is $51,000, which means we're making less now than we did. Now, this is something that you all realize, you all know full well. Did you know, but I'll ask you anyways, did you know that the price of gasoline in 14 years has increased 400%? 400%. Yeah, you know it. You know. I remember. Everybody who's, who's old enough to remember anything on September 11, 2001, knows exactly where they were when that happened. I remember we were in school. Our, our, our administrator, our, our dean at the time, who's, who's taught at the church, Tony Cook, came out and said, listen, uh, some airplanes just crashed in the World Trade Center in New York. Well, let's pray. And so we all got together and we prayed. We cried. Couldn't believe what just happened. Our country changed. I remember the day after, I remember getting out of school that day. I remember vividly one of the reasons why is because I was on my way to a job interview across town and my gas light had been on for two days. Because, you know, you know how it is. You, know how, you drive to the gas station. You've got it planned out so good that as you pull up, your car goes. <laughs> you open up the gas tank and. Well, I remember on September 11, 2001, everybody panicked. A terrorist attack in the United States. People drove, they flocked to the gas stations. They were in line, they were fighting over gas. I remember that gas in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, went from 80 cents a gallon. Some of you are like, Pastor Luke, I remember when it was five cents a gallon. Praise God. 80 cents a gallon <laughs> to $1.50. And the world was over. The world, oh, gas is so much, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to quit my job. I can't commute. I can't do this. Dollar, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, what I, I would give my left arm right now 
if I could get some of that liquid gold for $1.50. But you see, the reality is, is that we live under this tremendous financial pressure in our lives, whether it be from debt, whether it be from credit, whether it be from uh, retirement plans, whether it be from what society places on us, because of this whole issue that a standard of life equals a quality of life. We have pressure in our lives. Now, I read you a statement. We're going to come back to that. But you see, we have homes, we have cars, we have clothes, we have phones we cannot afford. We eat food we cannot afford. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We should be eating sometimes top ramen, but we're eating chilies. You're chuckling because you know it. You're like, yes. <laughs> We have all these things. We go on these vacations. My wife and I, we got this free, va- free condo in Hawaii. Everybody's going to ask me at the door, Pastor, look, how was your vacation? I heard that you got a free condo, a free stay in Hawaii for your anniversary. Yeah. Let me just tell you right now so you don't have to ask me, okay? Hawaii stinks. For those of you that are Polynesian, I'm so sorry that you came from those kind of islands because the sun was too warm, the water, was, the water felt too good, the, the beaches were too beautiful, the landscape was just too nice, the food was too awesome. There was nothing like flying in from Hawaii and landing in San Bernardino at 5 o'clock in the morning where I couldn't even see the mountains anymore. Okay? I'm being sarcastic, by the way. But see, what happens then is something happens, and here's here's what happens. There comes a time for all of these comforts, all of these amenities, all of these things that we live in for a settling of them. And when the bills come in, it's time to settle the accounts. Pressure sets in. Pressure sets in. Now I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm not going to answer it. What happens with pressure? I'll answer it later, I promise, okay? But what happens with pressure? I'm going to ask you that question. Now I'm going to take a total rabbit trail and take you somewhere else. Consider this. All throughout the gospel, all throughout the New Testament, the common theme is this. Our focus is on God and others. On God and others. Look what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. Go ahead and put the scripture up on the on screen. Somebody asked him, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of them all? Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like it, he says. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The central theme of the gospel message from Jesus Christ is to love God and to love others. We see this all throughout the New Testament. Bear one another burdens, care for one another, pray for one another, one another, one another, each other, another, 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 other, 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 other. Ah! The central theme of the gospel is God and others. Are we all on the same page on that? Can we, can we agree on that one? Yes. Okay, good. So what happens is the gospel message takes the focus off ourselves and puts it, number one, on God, number two, on other people. All right? All right? But then the problem we have going back to is pressure, tangible pressure, real pressure, pressure that we can feel. Did you know the average student graduating from college now graduates with $30,000 of debt? Did you know the average baby boomer in America has $100,000 of debt? Did you know the average Gen Xer, the the generation after baby boomers, carries $111,000 of debt? Did you know the average Gen Y or the millennial carries $40,000 of debt? You're saying, man, that's awesome. It's going down. No, they're not old enough yet. We have real, tangible pressure, real pressure in our lives. We can feel it. You can, you can, you can feel it grabbing onto you. Californians, on average, owe more than $300,000 on their mortgage. Did you know that is more than any state in America? We, talk, we, see, TV, we see TV shows about selling Hawaii. You look at the condos, of the, and you're like, oh, my gosh, how does somebody afford to live? California has the highest mortgage rate in the United States. Did you know of all the $830 billion of consumer debt we, I talked about earlier, that California accounts for not one one-fiftieth, because it's one of the 50 states, but one-twelfth of all of that is from California. 
See, the reality, guys, is, is that we live in pressure. We, you say, Pastor, look, I don't have debt. Pastor, look, I got rid of that. Pastor, look, I'm, I'm beyond that. My cars are paid off. My house is paid off. Great. But you understand that pressure doesn't just come from debt. Pressure doesn't just come from finances. Pressure doesn't just come from money going out or money coming in. Pressure comes from placing the importance of the standard of living on our lives because the standard of living equals the quality of our lives. Pressure comes from finance. So the problem is pressure. Did you know? Yesterday, I just read this in an article. Did you know 76% of Americans live week to week? Week to week. It's really quiet in this place because it's none of you. You all know somebody. No, you're like, dude, I know what you're talking about. 76% of Americans live week to week, paycheck to paycheck, no savings, no plan. 55% of Americans said if they lost their job right now, they could not sustain life for three months. Pressure. Pressure. Tangible, real pressure. So let me ask that question again. What happens with pressure? Okay. Let me, let, me get, let me answer it. Let me answer it. Let me give you a non-financial, because we're talking about money. Let's talk oh, oh gosh, so if I hear one more financial example, Pastor, like I'm going to explode. Okay, let's talk about something non-financial. Pain. Has anybody in this place ever broken a bone? Has anybody in this place ever cut themselves pretty deep, pretty good? Has anybody in this place ever... How many of you have broken a bone and cut yourself at the same time? Look at, wow. All right. How many of you ladies in the house have experienced tremendous pain, childbirth? <laughs> We've all gone through pain in one form or another. We've all gone through a, a great deal of pain one, in one form or another. I've got a scar on my hand. I remember I bought a knife when I was a, a teenager. My parents told me, don't buy the knife. It's too sharp for you. You're not responsible enough, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, you know as we all say, I know what I'm doing. I know more than you, okay? As I'm carving, I look down and I see my thumb bone. Yeah, because I missed, right? Missed the carving, carved my thumb, whatever. When we go through tremendous pain, when we experience that, when, when you're, you, you experience a broken bone, what happens to your focus? Are you thinking, man, I really wonder what my neighbor's having for lunch right now. <laughs> you know, I was talking to that guy yesterday, and he said he was going to do, I, I really hope so-and-so is having a really good day today. You're out there, and your, your legs go in the wrong direction. It's supposed to go down. It's going out that way. You look at the sunset. Oh, my God. You are so amazing. You are just an, 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 an artist and a poet in the sky. Oh, I'm so great. No, no. You don't think that when you've got pain going on in your life, right? You think, I don't give a hoot what that person's eating. I could care less if they're having a good day. As a matter of fact, I hope they're having a stinking day. And God, I'll see the sunset tomorrow. <laughs> pain is pressure. Pain is pressure in our lives. Why? Because we're, we're pressured to get rid of it. That's why we spend trillions of dollars on medicine and drugs to remove pain from our lives. But what does pain do? Pain brings our focus. It zeroes our focus right into the issue, right onto. You cut yourself, you might look away after, but you know what the first thing you do is you go, right? Because where's the pain? And then you're like me and you're like, blood, blood. Pain zeroes our focus on the issue. Pain is pressure. So I ask the question, what happens with pressure? Here it is. With pressure comes a self-centered life. With pressure comes a self-centered life. How can we fulfill the gospel message of focusing on God and others if we have so much pressure on our lives that we can only focus on the issue? Oh, that is where the challenge really is. Financial burdens create pressure. Pressure drives us to focus on ourselves, which is contrary to the gospel message and backs once again what Jesus says in Luke, the 16th chapter, that a man can only serve God or money, not both. 
There is the challenge. See, so it's not about, well, I'm not a vain person. It's not about going or getting the money. It's not about, Pastor Luke, I want to get this job so I can make millions. It's not about that. It's about living a life of pressure because when we are under pressure, we are held captive to those who are pressurizing us. You've ever been, or I'm not going to ask you you've ever been. There are some of you in this place that have gone through short sales. You don't have control. It's not your home. The bank owns the home. Because when you wanted to sell the home to get out from underneath it, who had to agree on the price? The bank. You've got credit cards maxed out. And now you need to go buy tires for your car. You take it to the, to the dealer. You take it to the tire shop. And they swipe the car. What is it going to say? Declined. No. Because who is telling you what you can and cannot do? The person that... That, that maintains the pressure. So when we have pressure on our lives, who are we serving? Who are we serving? That is where the real challenge is. So the question then, after the hammer comes down and you're all like, man, that's crazy. I know. I was, I was the same way when I wrote this. The, the question is, how do we become free of the pressure? Oh, it's, it's such an easy answer. You want to know how to be free from financial pressure? Oh, it's, it's such a good answer. It's so easy. I got to make sure you're ready, though. Are you ready? You want to be free from financial pressure? So easy. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get together. We're going to build a communal in the mountains. Men and women alike. We're going to grow our beards and our hair real long like Chewy right over there. All right, we're going to stop wearing shoes. We're going to go live in the mountains and, and, and go away from society. You're like, what church did I just go to? I'm just kidding. I'm, you're like, Pastor Luke, that sounds like a great idea. No, no, okay, no. You cannot run away from what you've got yourself into. Unfortunately, what you sow, you reap. So I'm not telling you, oh, well, I'll just declare bankruptcy. It'll be all good. Because one cannot effectively serve God in a financial crisis. Why? Because what, what kind of example are you? That guy says he's a Christian. He can't even get his money together. That guy says he's a Christian. He keeps mooching. He keeps asking me. He keeps, I keep, I buy that guy everything. And then he invites me to church. So how do we become free of this pressure? How do we become free of this pressure? This is where I'm going to take just a quick seg segue. And I want to remind you of Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. He had a dream that one day his children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. I want to remind you of that because here's what I'm about to say. Do not judge me by the way I dress, by the way I look, by the age that I am. I'm, for those of you that are older than me, the things I'm about to say are common sense but backed by the Bible. But please do not judge me based on my age. Judge me based on what's coming out of my mouth. Could you do that for me? Can, okay? Because some of you I know you're going to be like, man, what are you talking about? Judge me based on what's coming out. And if it's truth, take it. How do we get rid of this pressure? How do we get free? The, the title was Freedom for Our Future. How do we free ourselves of pressure? Number one, freedom comes with a choice. Freedom comes with a choice. It begins with a choice. We have got to choose. Yeah. We have got to make a choice to do something. To choose. I love what Joshua says in Joshua, the 24th chapter. It's the final words. It's his last words of his life. He's exhorting the children of Israel. And he says to the children of Israel, If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord then choose for yourself to stay who you serve. Church, we're going to make a decision, one way or the other, to serve God or money. One way or the other, it's a choice. You say, I don't want to make that choice. If you don't make the choice, you've already made it. We cannot escape this choice. Joshua says, choose this day who you will serve. Was it, is, it, is it the gods of your fathers? The fathers, the forefathers, the people that have come before us that told us this is how we live our lives? Choose this day. It's, it's your choice. Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to hold you back. If you want to live for that, if you want to live under pressure, you want to live this kind of a life, it's yours to live. He says, choose this day. Whether the gods of your fathers you served on the other side of the river, going on the second part of that verse, he says, or the gods of the Amorites on whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today, we have got to start making a choice, a decision. To free ourselves from financial burden. Now, again, I'm not, uh, uh, let me, uh, I, won't, I won't go there. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you in a minute what I'm not saying, because you're all thinking what I'm saying. I'm going to clarify that. The rich young ruler made a choice. 
He walked away because he had many possessions. He walked away, why? Because he was rich. He made a choice. We will make a choice. We want change in our lives to start. We want change. Change is the hot word. Change. Blue and red on each side, a little bit of white here and there. You know. Posters, stickers, you know what I'm talking about? Change. Change doesn't come until we, we, until we begin making changes. God, I got to get out of this financial mess. God, I got to get out from underneath this pressure. But I don't want to do anything. You're God. You do it. God says, well, you got to start making changes. It's time to start making a choice. Who are you going to serve? Number two, how to get free from this? Pay attention to the dollar. Start paying attention to the dollar. Well, Pastor Luke, I know what you're talking about. The dollar according to the Australian dollar is 85 cents. The dollar according to the Canadian dollar is dollar 85. I'm not talking about the exchange rate. I'm talking about your dollar bill. All of them. Some of you got a lot of them. Some of you got none of them. Some of you, some of you got negatives, right? You're like, man, I wish I had a dollar. <laughs> Pay attention to the dollar. Pay attention to the dollar. I have a financial advisor friend. He's a, he's a family member of mine. I remember we were sitting, we were talking. And he says, you know, here's how I see it. I see every dollar that I have as a worker of mine. And I want to put my dollar to work because if I don't put my dollar to work, I will work for my dollar. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't care about the dollar. Dollar's not going to solve my financial mess. Dollar's not going to solve this, this thing that I've gotten myself into. Dollar's not going to solve, one dollar's not going to fix my retirement. But it starts with the one. Even though you might be worried about the tens or the hundreds or the, the millions, it starts with the one. Jesus himself even said, if you're faithful in the little, you'll be faithful, put it up, you'll be faithful with much. Put the verse up, guys. If you are faithful in the little, you will be faithful with the large. You want to fix retirement? You want to fix your finances? It starts with the dollar. Because what happens is you might fix the tens of thousands, but if you don't fix the issue... The tens of thousands will resort right back to where they came from. Because what it boils down to is not how much you make or how little you make. What boils down to is how much we give or not, it's not how much we give away or how much we take in. What boils down to is the biggest competitor for our heart is money. And until we address the issue that standard of life and quality of life are not the same thing in our lives, we will always fall into the same trap. We've got to pay attention to the dollar. Number three. To get free from this pressure, number three, you got, I'm going to give you wisdom that my daddy gave me and his daddy gave him. All right, here it is. So, see, so simple. Number three, you got to make a plan. You got to work a plan. You're starting to say, Pastor Luke, you sound like my mother. Well, I don't know. I told you, remember, this is common sense stuff. You got to make a plan. And work applied. Did you know two thirds of now? I know this isn't you. I know, I know, but you know somebody. You know somebody like this. Two thirds of America do not budget or save. Not you. Not me. No, 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 no. I know where everything goes. Two thirds of America does not live on a budget or save. Benjamin Franklin said it like this: If you fail to plan, you are actually planning to fail. How are we going to know where our dollar goes? Or how are we going to know how much we can and cannot spend if we don't know what's coming in and going out? You know, when you have a budget in place, I know, you're like, Pastor Luke, you're sounding like my mom. I know. When you have a budget in place, it's so much easier to say no to something that you want that you don't need versus when you don't because you have no clue. We have no clue. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. If you're not making ends meet, Pastor Luke, hallelujah, that's me. If you're not making ends meet, you've essentially got three options in your life. Three options in your life. Number one, the hardest option of all. Door number one, cut spending. Ah, I don't like that door. That's a lousy door. I don't want to do that. I don't want to stop, I don't want to stop drinking that coffee. Or I don't, want to, I don't want to get rid of or sell this car. Or I, don't want to, I, want to, I want to live on that. Cut spending, number one. Okay, well, I don't want to do that option. Okay, option number two. So super easy. Mooch. Mooch! Hey, man, can I borrow, can I borrow a dollar? L like, like, what was his name again, Pastor Dan? Wimpy. 
Wimpy, I'll pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today. Right? I don't know if, I don't know if in, in Popeye he ever showed up with the cash, right? Or option number three. Option number three. Raise the debt ceiling. We criticize the government. God, I can't believe you guys, you're out of control, you're spending so much, why would you even do that? But at least they have a budget. <laughs> so eventually it's gonna boil down to the hard choices. It's gonna take work. That's why Jesus teaches us the parable of the stewards, the parable of the talents, why? Because Christianity involves work. It does. It does. We've got to make a plan. Start making a plan, working a plan. Start making a plan to retire debt. Listen, debt's not a sin. Let me just tell you that right now, okay, so you can breathe a little deeper. <gasps> debt's not a sin. But it's not always necessarily good for you either. Start making a plan to retire debt. Why are we in freedom for our future? Because this church no longer wants to be subject to somebody telling us what we can and cannot say. We live in a society where you say one wrong word and you are crucified professionally. What happens when Christianity becomes unpopular? We are making a plan and working a plan to retire debt. Make a plan to save. There's going to come a day. Oh, Pastor Luke, you're sounding like my mom so much right now. There's going to come a day when you're going to want to buy something that you cannot afford. The question is, how does that come? What do you do with it? Start making a plan. Retirement. Retirement, huge, hot topic right now. Did you know the three big detriments to retirement are unrealistic expectations, the unwillingness to change lifestyles, and the lack of a financial plan? Doesn't that sound a lot like the three points we just talked about? Make a choice. Well, my, 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 my life is going to have to be a little bit different, otherwise I'm going to eat Alpo dog food for the rest of my life. <laughs> Secondly, I'm going to have to have uh, expectations. I'm going to have to watch my dollars where it goes because I don't get very many of them anymore. Thirdly, I have to make a plan because it's easier to say no when I don't need something when I have a plan in place. Now, let me confirm what I did not say. Okay, can we do that? Can, can, yes. Okay, the reason I say that is because somebody came up to me one time and he was like, man, Pastor Luke, I gave an example. He says, man, Pastor Luke, what you said so bothered me that I couldn't listen to you for the rest of the message. And I said, what are you talking about? He, just gave, he, he gave the exact opposite of the example that I, everything I said I did, he said I did not do. I didn't say any of that. So let me clarify so that you don't shut off, so that you don't go walk away on Facebook or on Twitter and say, Pastor Luke said, because you cannot say that because I'm telling you what I did not say. Okay. All right. Okay. Do not say I said. Christians must be poor. Never said that. Do not say, I said, you can't serve God if you have a financial crisis or wreck in your life. Did not say that. I said, effective service. Do not say, I said, you cannot have a good standard of life. If you say that I said we have to be poor, if you say that I said we cannot have financial problems, if you say I said we have to have a low standard of living, I will never talk to you again. <laughs> but what I am saying, what I am saying, is that in order to be effective as Christians and as servants of God, we have got to have our financial lives in order. Amen. In order. We have to. It's time for us to come out from the lie that our culture and our society lives and to live a realistic life free from financial burden or pressure. Let me say this statement. Prosperity is not just financial gain. We think of prosperity, oh, the prosperity message. We think of gold rings and Cadillacs. But let me tell you something. Prosperity is not just financial gain. Prosperity is fulfilling God's will for our life. God told Adam and Eve, 
Be fruitful and multiply. Jesus said that if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. He says that a tree is known by its fruit. Why? Fruit is multiplication. Fruit is wealth. Fruit is prosperity. Why? Because it's prospering. So prosperity is not just financial gain. Once again, I did not say God doesn't want us blessed. As a matter of fact, let me clarify. Let me clarify. I firmly, wholeheartedly, without a shadow of doubt in my life, believe that God's desire for his children, you and I, is for us to be blessed. Including big, capital, underlined, circled, highlighted, 35-point font versus everything else. Including financial wealth. I believe it. I believe in prosperity. But, big but, big one. But if money is the issue of our lives, the biggest competitor for our heart right now, if we are in a state of financial mess, if we are not in order right now, why would God bless us with the very thing that is tripping us up? Because... The Bible says in James, God does not tempt. So where's God in my financial prosperity? God's saying, I'm here waiting to go alongside of you and to get out of this mess, to jump over the hurdle of finances in your life so that as you are running the race, that hurdle is in the past. It's not coming up anymore. There's other things to go ahead for. And God says, I want you to be blessed. That's why I believe Jesus says we can live a Matthew, the sixth chapter life of not to worry. Don't worry, Jesus says. Well, who are you talking about? Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're gonna, where you're going to live. Um, Hello? That's what we worry about all day long. Pressure. God's desire for us is to not have a life of pressure. And why? Because when we jump the hurdle, when we get beyond it, that is when financial increase comes. Blessings from God financially comes. What it all boils down to is this. How you view God in life determines your outcome. Get that, get that, get that. How you view life or how you view God in life determines your outcome. Is God a big slot machine in the sky that every time you go or every time you're in need, God, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, like the seagulls on Nemo, mine, 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 cha-ching, mine, 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 cha-ching. Did you know that in, in, in slot machines the house always wins? The Bible tells us in the book of James that we don't receive when we ask God because we ask amiss. We're asking the wrong questions. God's not the slot machine that's going to pour out money to solve our problems. God's going to give us the ability, the grace to go through it and to live through it so we can be a witness to others around us. Well, I've made some bad choices and God's just punishing me for it. Did you know that the Bible says that God forgets our sins? He removes us from them? God's not punishing you for the decisions that you and I have made. Simply put, we live in a world where earthly actions bring to us earthly consequences. We say it like this in Galatians, the sixth chapter. What you sow, you reap. God is not mocked. Can't pull the wool over on God's eyes. God's not punishing you. But you've got consequences for your actions. I've got consequences for my actions. God's not existent. I have prayed and prayed and prayed and believed, and God has never shown up in my finances. Could it be, speaking of pressure, that you have been focusing so much on the issue that you have lost sight of God, the solution? The Bible tells us in Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, verse number 13, that if we seek God with all our heart, biggest competitor of our heart, money, if we seek God with all our heart, he will be found. So how we view God in life determines our outcome. So we've made bad choices in the past. So some of us in this place right now are over our heads. There is no better time than right now to start making the choice to seek after God, to look at God not as my, my uh, bailer outer, as my, my flotation device or the one that's going to wipe everything clean, but rather God as my help, God as my deliverer, God as the one that will come alongside. And like Paul said, when I am weak, that is when he is made strong. You are in the best place right now if you're in a financial wreck, 
in your relationship with God, you are in the best place you can possibly be. Why? Because it doesn't matter how good the financial advisor is down the street. God is the best financial advisor you and I will ever have in our lives. How we view God determines our outcome in life. I love what A.W. Tozer said. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. How do we view God? How is he? What do we see God? Dr. Barron and Lisa had an amazing, Dr. Barron, you blew my mind with that statement about God will rarely manifest himself beyond what you proclaim him to be. You proclaim God to be the Savior, people will get saved. You proclaim God to be the Savior and the healer, people will get saved and healed. How you see God, how you think of God is the most important thing about us. I love what Paul the Apostle says. Paul says, I, I, not, that I, not that I speak in regard to need in Philippians, the fourth chapter. I've learned in whatever state I am to be, in content, to be content. I know how to be abased, to be a, a prosperous. I know how to abound. Or I know how to be low and how to be high. Everything and all things I have learned to be full and hungry, both suffer and abound. I love this. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Church, look to your neighbor and say, I can do all things through Christ. So even though in the very beginning I broke your heart, if you're in that place, hey, listen, I'm preaching to myself too. And I said, you can't be effective if you're in a financial mess. You're like, man, it doesn't mean it's the end. It means this is the beginning. And you say, I can do all things through Christ. How you view God determines your outcome. Look what he says in verse number 19. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. According to his riches and glory. It's time for us to be effective in the gospel message of Jesus Christ by getting our financial lives in order and coming out from underneath the pressure so we can focus on God and so we can focus on others. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Listen, I want to do something. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you first a favor before I ask you a question. Please don't get up. Please don't leave. Let me ask you something that's very important, very important that you and I listen to this and examine what's about to be said. I, want to, I made a statement today. I said, how you view God determines your outcome in life. Let me ask you, how do you view God? What, what is God to you? What, what is, are you going to go to heaven at the end? I mean, what, what is life all about? If you died right now, are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? You might say, well, Pastor Luke, I, I don't believe in heaven or I don't believe in hell. Let me tell you something. Just because you don't see it, just because you can't feel it, just because you haven't experienced it personally, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Look at it. Many of you have never, I just got back from Hawaii. Many of you have never seen Tahiti. You've never experienced it. You never felt it. But you know it's there. You know that the radio waves going between me and the sound booth right now are in existence, even though you can't see them or feel them, because you can hear the sound of my voice. Come on. Heaven's a real place. Hell's a real place. Just because you haven't been there, just because you haven't seen it, just because you haven't heard about it, or haven't, you know, you, you can't feel it right now, doesn't mean it's not real. How do you view God? Well, how, do you, how are you going to get there? Well, you know, I think I'm going to get there. I hope so. I want to. My parents told me as a kid that I'm going to go to heaven. I go to church. Christians or people who go to church go to heaven. That's why I'm here. I've got a Jesus tattoo on my, on my body. I wear a cross around my neck. I'm a good person. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can get to God's heaven because you're a good person? Because you go to church, because you volunteer in the children's or youth ministry, because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you got a scripture tattooed or you got a cross around your neck, because you, you think, you hope, you want, you wish, you desire to get to heaven. You see, nowhere can you find that you're going to get into God's heaven your way. The reality is, is that we can't get to God's heaven any other way but His because it's God's heaven, it's God's way. And Jesus Christ is that way. You see, Jesus says that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through Him. Can't do it your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way, through Jesus. Jesus speaks to a man by the name of Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. You can read the account for yourself. They're talking about the subject of eternal life, and Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is. Oh, you're thinking of what Hollywood, you're thinking about what culture, you're thinking about what society has made that term out to be weirdo, crazy, out-of-control Christianity. We just talked about the lies that we live from culture. Just because they say that doesn't mean that's what it is. I don't care what Hollywood defines it as. They have no concept of God. Simply put, to be born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Here it is. You've given Him all your heart. You've given Him all your life. It's an all or nothing relationship 
with God. I quoted to you Jeremiah 29 chapter, verse number 13 says, when you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. Not with a piece, not with a little bit, not with a Sunday here every once in a while. Listen, I know you already know who Jesus is. It's not about your mental knowledge. Well, I've memorized John 3, 16. I memorized some of the scripture. I know what you're talking about. It's not about that. Why? The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. The distance that we miss heaven oftentimes is 18 inches. The distance between our head and our heart. Because it's an all or nothing relationship. It's all about all of your heart. It's about all of your life. Let me prove it to you. The last book of the Bible, the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. He's speaking to people like us. And he says, listen, he says he's, he's coming back. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or he better find us cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, he says he will vomit us woo, out of his mouth. Shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Let's, let's look at that. It's a little bit in, a little bit up. You know, a little half here, half there, not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God. You know, you know as well as I that in any relationship in your life, whether it be marriage, whether it be family, whether it be friendship, whether it be business, whatever it might be, if you were to come to that person and say, hey, listen, I'm coming into this thing with only half. Half of my heart, half of the relationship, I'm only going to give you half of the effort. You know full well, so, is I, so do I, that that relationship would never succeed. Yet we think we can go to God and say, God, I'll only give you one Sunday a month. God, I'm only going to give you a little bit here, a little bit there, a token prayer every once in a while. When God says, I want it all, all or nothing, all of your heart, I want all of your life. You say, well, man, Pastor Luke, what, what do I do then? Simply put, I want to give you the opportunity. The whole purpose is for this, to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. Remember, again, I said the statement, how you view God determines your outcome in life. God's not in heaven on an anthill with the magnifying glass waiting to burn you up. God's not there with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head for the next decision you make. You see, God loved you and I so much that he gave Jesus Christ to die a beaten bloody mess on the cross so that we could be free. To come out from underneath the pressure, not just financial, but the pressure of life. And to live life in abundance through Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, I'm going to go one, two, and I count to three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that. Bang! And I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to ensure your place with God in heaven for eternity. To, to seal where you're going. To seal your view of God and to solidify it today with the right view. And when I smack my hand on my Bible, bang, just like that, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hey, today, I want to make sure. Today, I want to go to heaven. Pastor Luke, I want to give God my heart. I want to give God my life. You see, the Bible says, Jesus says, that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. But if you deny him, he will deny you. See, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. I, I don't know if I can do that. Let me encourage you. You might feel that moment of embarrassment. But let me encourage you to stop. Don't let an, a, a, an irrational moment or an irrational emotion, embarrassment, stop you from making the best decision you can possibly make as a human being. To seal your fate with God in paradise, in heaven, forever and ever, giving him your heart and your life today. It's your choice. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. It's your call. He loved you enough to give you the free choice to choose or not. So who should raise your hand if you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life? In just a moment, if that's you, when I clap my hands or I smack my hand on my Bible, just pop your hand up. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise your hands? Maybe you've never done it. Maybe, 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 maybe you never followed through with it. You did it at Harvest or Billy Graham Crusade or something like that in youth group, but you never really followed through with it. Today, come on, let's make this today. This is your day. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? If you've been living lukewarm, if you've been playing games with God, if you've had the wrong view of God, the wrong outlook of God, God's been non-existent, God's my slot machine, God's out there to punish me. Come on, today is the day right now. Let's, let's get ourselves in line by accepting the free gift of salvation from God. It's your choice, your free will choice. Wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, from the front to the back. Hey, you guys in the family rooms on both sides, I'm talking to you. You're outside in the foyer. You're watching online right now on your computer, on your TV screen. Hey, if that's you, this is your moment. This is the day of your salvation. Don't let another moment pass you by. This is your time. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. Wherever you're at, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it when I count to three. And listen, be proud about it. This is the best decision you'll ever make. It's time to go forward. This is your moment. This is your day. I'm going to count wherever you're at, from the front to the back, family rooms, wherever you're at, in the foyer, hear the sound of my voice in the Love Rock Cafe, wherever you are. This is your moment. This is your time. Get ready. Here we go. 
On the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Where are you guys at? Let me see your hands. Eight wise people. Nine over there. Ten, I see you right over there. Ten, eleven, twelve, I see you guys right over there. Thirteen, fourteen, I see you guys. Is that an elbow or a hand? I can't tell. It's a hand? Fifteen, all right. Sixteen in the back, I got you. I got you guys over here. Sixteen wise people, seventeen, eighteen. Where are you at in this place today? In the family room? Is that, is that where you're waving at? 19, I got you back there. Oh, where are you at, number 20? See, man, I wonder if I should. Yeah. I see the ushers pointing. Give me a little wave. Give me a little contrast. 20, I got you back there. 21 over there. Praise God. Hey, let's glorify God for 21 wise people. Okay. Here's what we do. In the family rooms, the back row, front row, wherever you're at. You don't get saved by raising your hand. Remember I said you said, I want to do it. Now it's time to follow through. This is the very first moments of your future life. We're going to change destinies together in a moment. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. The Bible says you believe with your mouth and confess with your heart, or believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and rose from the dead. You shall be saved. We're going to pray a prayer together. We're going to change destinies together. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. As we stand, Elijah's going to sing a song. If you raised your hand, all 21 of you, or 22, 23, 24, 25, you didn't, you know you should have. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, friend if you need friend. If you came with somebody or somebody brought you, look at them and say, hey, go with me or I'll go with you. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get in the aisle and come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies together right now. As we all stand, please, nobody leave as people are coming forward. If that's you in this place, come on. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Let's change destinies right now. Amazing love, how can it be? Yeah, come on. My king will die for me. You can come, come on. This is your time. Amazing love, I know it's true. Wherever you're at, come on. This is it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Amazing love, how can it be? Great choice. Congratulations, you might awesome. give yeah. time for awesome. me. Right on, man. Come on, you bring it, bring it. Congratulations. That's it. Come on, it's Amazing not too late. You can come. Love, I know it's true. Hey, right on, man. Great it's job. my joy right to honor yeah. you. Yeah, come on. Praise God, praise God. Guys, listen, today's a good day. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. You're going to be born again. It's your birthday today. New birthday. Praise God. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. Okay? See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. Like Noel, Joel. All right? He's going to take you right over there. Oh, oh, oh. You're like, wait, right? Nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets, and you made it through me. Okay? I promise no more weird stuff goes on. No more. Only when Pastor Dan preaches. Only, he's going to take you right over there, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, okay? He's going to give you some free information, some literature. He says, what do I do? You're going to walk out of this place and say, now what? We're going to point you in the right direction. Last thing he's going to do is he's going to offer you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. You, there's somebody that will meet with you. You go to the gym, you get a personal trainer to teach you how to get strong. There's somebody that will meet with you right here at church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee in the cafe. Sit with you personally or you and your wife or whoever it might be. Sit with you and teach you some things about the Word of God for five weeks. Not a long time. Not asking you to. To, to, to join a college or anything like that. Five simple weeks to teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong so you don't go back to the life that you're walking through. And here's one thing I want to present to you. I want to present a challenge, something to think about, something to digest. You received the Word of God today. That's why you're here. You heard the Word of God. I want to challenge you. Give us, a, give us 12 months. I'm not asking you to join a cult. I'm not asking you to join a church, sign any documents or contracts. I'm asking you to give us 12 months to come and sit and hear the Word of God. Listen to the Word of God, apply it to your life, and see what God will do in your life. And I promise, I guarantee, that if you do that, your life will never be the same. And your expectations of what God can do will be far exceeded because God is a big God. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you 
in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.